Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are going to be talking about House of the Dragon, uh, the upcoming spin-off of Game of Thrones. 21st of August is when it's going to be um, landing and we've already got a really good idea I think about what it's going to feel like, what it's going to look like. This is an open q and I will frame it around as I always do questions from my patrons uh, but I will try and take as many questions from the chat as possible. That's what I do particularly with these open Q and A's, is uh, just give a chance to to pick up any random questions you may have about this as we go along. I will just very quickly go over a few things that are going on in the, the wider world before we get into House of the Dragon. I thought it would probably be worthwhile. We've had a lot of announcements about when things are happening, and new um, trailers for things over the course of the last couple of weeks. There's a lot going on, and I thought it's probably worth just having a very quick rundown of what's happening in the next six months in terms of epic TV shows, high fantasy TV shows and things like that. Um, because I can't remember a time like this where it's literally every few weeks we've got a completely new, excellent TV show coming out. So let me just very quickly run through what we've got. 26th of June, so coming up in just a couple of weeks' time, but over that, Westworld, <clears throat> pardon me, Westworld Season 4 is happening. This has kind of come under the radar quite a bit. They've not done the same amount of publicity that they have um for previous seasons but the trailer which came out a couple of weeks ago looks very good so um i'm not going to be covering this in the same detail i did previous seasons i would highly recommend you check out hacks dogma who i collaborated with all the way through uh last season as well as the season before of westworld he knows everything there is to know about Westworld. Absolutely top-notch channel. I cannot recommend it enough. So if, you, if you're if you a big Westworld fan and you want to see um, the best coverage of it possible, go and check out Hacks Dogma. 1st of July, Stranger Things Season 4 Part 2. I haven't watched Season 4 Part 1 yet, but I've heard very good things about that. Season 4 Part 2 is, is happening on the 1st of July. The 5th of August... The Sandman is happening. Now, The Sandman, for those who don't know it, actually, if I'd thought about it, I'd have grabbed the graphic novel and shown you. This is uh, generally accepted to be one of, if not the finest examples of graphic novels there are. Written by Neil Gaiman. Um, absolutely brilliant. It ran for something like 75 issues, I think. Um, brilliant story has been made into a fantastic um, adaptation on that I've been listening to on Audible, uh, full cast adaptation. Now it's been made into a TV show. It's going to be on Netflix. The trailer just came out earlier this week. If you want to check that out, there's a link on my Twitter. I think that looks pretty amazing. I'm very excited about it. You may not know huge amounts about The Sandman, but if you like Neil Gaiman, if you like dark fantasy uh, for this will be dark, uh, then on 21st of August, we've got House of the Dragon, which we're going to be talking about uh, in just a moment. The 2nd of September, Rings of Power, Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Um, that's going to come up, so there's only like a couple of weeks uh, between those two. Then we've got a few other things we haven't got release dates for yet, but are almost certainly happening later on this year. His Dark Materials Season 3, they have finished filming it, they're in post-production now. Um, I'm expecting it second half of the year, probably sometime around October. Doctor Who, there's only going to be one more episode this year, but it's the regeneration episode. So if you want to see 13 turning into 14, um, that I think is going to be in October. The reason I think that's going to be on October is but I apparently they want to do this as part of the BBC's centenary celebrations. Yes, the BBC has been around for 100 years and Doctor Who has been around for most of that. So um, there, I think they will probably want to wrap that episode up as part of their celebration. So October, I think Doctor Who Regeneration, Wheel of Time Season 2, they've finished filming. Um, again, they're in post-production. I This feels like November-ish to me. Um, it feels like the kind of thing that they would follow on from the Rings of Power. 
So that's what uh, uh, we're looking at there. And then finally, The Witcher Blood Origin. This is a limited series. I th they're changing their minds about how many episodes, uh, either four or six episodes, a mini series. This is looking back into the history of the world of The Witcher, the creation of The Witchers, um, um, and giving us hopefully a whole lot more lore about things like the conjunction of the spheres and things like that. I'm looking forward to that quite a lot. It sounds like it's been quite a troubled production, but um, I, I think they're probably now aiming for the semi-traditional now, which are just before Christmas release date. So there's a lot of things happening over the course of the next um, few months. Th that's more than one exciting thing happening each month in my book. And, and there are many, I know there's many more TV programs coming out that people are also excited about. People uh, tell me the Umbrella Academy. I've still not really managed to get to watch that. A new season of that's coming out as well. Um, and I think Shadow of Bone too. Th there's lots happening. Uh, but th I just wanted to give you that quick rundown. The other thing I wanted to talk about before we get into House of the Dragon is... The Rings of Power, because this is going to be, in terms of publicity, ramping up over the course of the next two, three months to hugely high levels. So expect an increasing volume of bits of information being drip fed out, new pictures, new interviews, new articles. The latest is um, this. Uh, which I hope you can see, uh, Empire Magazine special, uh, which had it came out today just in the UK. So if you're in America, then don't try and um, hunt for it down your, your local uh, store. Um, but it is available online, so you can get access to it. Not huge amounts of new information, but some very pretty pictures. Um, so take that as, as an example there's some really nice uh, stuff in there but this is also a heads up that tomorrow i will have some more information for you about rings of power um the you will remember that i can't even remember when it was a month or so ago uh, i was invited to that screening of some footage from the rings of power also uh those of us who are there got to ask some questions of the showrunners and I am now at liberty to tell you what they said which is good because there is some actual real information coming up what I was thinking I might do actually is something that I, I've not tried it before so I don't know how well it will work but I thought I would give it a, a go as a different way to sort of yeah, exchange uh, information do sort of Q&A is do uh, an an AMA asked me anything on this subject on Twitter. I thought perhaps on Saturday, uh, maybe nine o'clock my time, so 4 p.m. Eastern time, I will advertise it. If you don't follow me on Twitter, you can find me very easily in Deep Geek. Um, and I just thought I'd just sit there for, for an hour and just answer any questions. Um, I, as a as a teaser for that, and, and I will probably just put this out beforehand rather than wait for somebody to ask, but I did go into that with one burning question above everything else, uh, something that I wanted to ask the showrunners. The question I asked the showrunners, I asked them both to their faces, we had a chance to mingle afterwards, asked both of the showrunners to their faces, uh, what is going on with the timeline contraction in the second age this is for me the big issue in terms of adaptation how closely will this be mirroring what tolkien set down for the second age depends on what they're doing um for the timeline contraction and i kind of hedged my answer to that when i've talked about it before but i can now tell you they did give me a straight answer they looked me in the eye and they gave me a straight answer so um, I will tell you about that tomorrow when I can, um, and I will do an AMA over on Twitter on Saturday so that uh, all the other things, because they, they cover quite a lot of ground, all the other things I will happily answer any questions uh, from if, if if I asked it, if anyone else asked it, if, if they just gave some information, I'm very happy to share it. So uh, uh, that's, that, for me, that was the main other than obviously seeing the footage, that was the, the main thing for going there, was to actually try and understand who the showrunners are and what they have done, what's their approach been. So I'll, I'll try and put that um, across. 
Um, okay, I think that is it in terms of uh, updates more broadly. Um, we Let's get into uh, the subject for today, which is House of the Dragon. I think I had a... Uh, super chat. I just want to quickly get into. Um, uh, before I get into it. So Roman Lakovitz, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, this is slightly off topic from House of the Dragon, but Song of Ice and Fire related. The Song of Ice and Fire app says that Lem Lemon Cloak was in Beric's party that Ned sent after the mountain, implying that Ned or Robert know him. Is it still likely that he's Richard Lonmouth then, given Richard's connection to Rhaegar? Well, interesting question. So this is uh, related to a theory that that I love. It's not my theory. It's a theory that Lady Gwyn over on Radio Westeros has, uh, she's championed, uh, and I've had her on this uh, live stream, and she's explained it, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, it's a very niche theory, but it just works perfectly. I'm not going to go into all of the detail of it, but basically Lem Lemon Cloak is Richard Lonmouth, who was one of Rhaegar's best friends. He was his squire. He disappears after Rhaegar's uh, uh, rebellion, uh, after Robert's rebellion. We don't know what happened. Now, him disappearing is not the surprising thing. Anyone who was in that inner circle for Rhaegar went somewhere they were either died or went in exile or they were killed everybody in that small group so the fact he disappeared is not a surprise the the theory is through a lot of textual evidence that he turns up as lem lemon cloak does the fact that the um the app the world of ice and fire app uh, say that he went was part of the original group of the Brotherhood without that became the Brotherhood without Manners. Does that undermine that theory? Personally, I think not. Um, the for two reasons. Firstly, the World of Ice and Fire app is not canon. It's generally generally referred to as semi-canon. There are a lot of things on there that do make sense. There are a few things on there that. Um, are not official. George R. R. Martin has not confirmed that this is the case. Um, he did not write the material for that. Um, so we have to treat it as semi-canon. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, does this affect anything? Well, I don't think so. Beric was chosen by Ned, I'm pretty sure, because he trusted him. He trusted him, not just because you know maybe he met him a couple of times, but because Beric was tied in with House Dane. He was actually engaged to be married to a member of House Dane. So that's why he trusted him. Who could Richard Lunmouth, if he was hiding, who could he possibly trust House Dane? So it's entirely possible that... He just stayed undercover, and then when Beric was assembling a group of people, he had this person that he knew who was associated with House Dane, and he brought along with him. So I don't think that that undermines the theory personally uh, in the slightest. But um, uh, thank you for the the question. Um, and uh, Jemeth Lawthorne saying, Woo, first time catching live. Read this out loud so I can brag to my friends. Well. Happy, uh, happy to uh, to read that one out. I'm uh, not sure how impressed your friends will be if uh, by being uh, read out by me, but uh, there you go. Anyway, okay. So we're talking about um, House of the Dragon. I, I will do a very, very brief. I, I think we all understand roughly what we we've got coming up for House of the Dragon. But just to remind you, season one. We don't know how many seasons we're going to be. The working assumption is five. This is covering the Dance of the Dragons. Season one is going to be covering the build-up to the dance. It may creep into the opening salvos, but that's about it. So what we will have is a whole season that covers quite a large span of time. They've cast a few younger actors for some of the central characters uh, so for when they were sort of teenagers or children. 
and we we've got a, a period of time of I, I don't know co covering all the way back probably in flashback to um the great council at harren hall so a long build up season one is going to be that uh, the the build up as a whole season two all the way through to season five will be the actual dance um now I'll I'll start. Why don't I start with uh, one of the questions from uh, one of my patrons because this kind of introduces a subject about the handling of it, and I, I want to talk about the handling of it uh, and then address the question. So, the Children of Jack Acid says, in the actual Fire and Blood book, what are some key moments in the lives of the Targaryens where Septon Eustace and Mushrooms accounts? definitely contradict one another. And in those examples, do you, me, have strong opinions on whether Mushroom or Eustace or neither of them is telling the correct version of things? In other words, can we catch either source in any deliberate lies? Okay, so I will answer the, um, the specific there in just one moment. But in terms of the handling, I think I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating because this is very important in terms of what we're going to be seeing. Fire and Blood is written as a, an in-world history book with sources. Um, the two mentioned that the two biggest sources, we have Septon Eustace and we have Mushroom, who often contradict each other. They often have different interpretations. They're not always um, claiming to have inside knowledge. They're sometimes saying, uh, and they're sort of being quoted by Gildane, the actual author, in-world author of this, as being Mushroom thinks that this was such and such happened. It's not that Mushroom claims to have witnessed it all the time, it's just that that's what Mushroom thinks happened. And we should therefore take that with as big or little a pinch of salt as you wish when it comes to Mushroom, similarly with Septon Eustace. So that's how the book operated. George R. R. Martin, on his Not A Blog, a week or so ago, he did explicitly address this um, by saying that in on the TV show, they are not going to show all these different perspectives. They're just going to show one story. So one truth that goes through. Now, that doesn't, under in George R. R. Martin's uh, mind anyway, that doesn't undermine the book in any way. They're, this is their interpretation of events, the, the showrunner's interpretation of events, and he's happy with it. And sometimes he thinks that their interpretation is better than perhaps what his interpretation had been. So he's very flattering about their approach. But the key point is that they are just going to go with this one idea. And that means that we will, going through this, when we're starting to analyse this, that we're not going to be analysing it or breaking it down and saying, well, what's going to happen next? But we will be starting to compare the book and the TV show because of creative decisions that have been made. So that's not necessarily critiquing it, but that is where we're going to be coming at this, uh, or the, the lens with which we're going to be coming at this from. Um, but you asked, uh, Children of Jack Acid, you were asking for some examples about where Mushroom and Eustace disagree. There, there are a lot of these. Uh, I've picked out just a few. I just sort of noted them down here. Um, and I think at the end of that, Hopefully they will give a flavour of what my view is on who we can trust and who we can't. Um, so there's a few instances. There's uh, why Damon was forced to leave King's Landing um, the first time around. Um, now, Eustace says that he seduced or suggests that perhaps it was because he seduced Rhaenyra. Mushroom says that he he seduced Rhaenyra and, and taught her how to seduce Kristen Cole. Um, now, where do we go with that? I think we probably look for the common factor. It, in both of them, Damon got too close to Rhaenyra for Viserys's liking, and that fits the facts that Viserys then cast him out of court. Um, so, 
when Mushroom adds an extra layer that the motivation for Damon to do that was to help her to seduce Kristen Cole, it's possible. But at the same time, it, might Damon just have been using that as a ruse to get closer to her himself? At this point, we have to remember Damon is trying to get as close to possible to power. And the close, the way that he could get to power is probably by marrying Rhaenyra. And so him trying to get close to her seems to go in that. So out of this one, who do we trust? I think actually possibly both, but I think Mushroom's adding on an extra layer there that's probably not necessary. Um, then uh, there was that last night again, Another time, the, the, before Rhaenyra was going to go off and get married, there was this, an incident happened. We've talked about this quite a few things. An incident happened with uh, Kristen Cole. Now, Eustace says that Kristen Cole went to her and suggested that they elope, and she said no. Mushroom says that she went to him. This is sort of in line with his idea that she she was uh, lusting after him, so she went after him and he said no. Which of these two works best? I mean, I think either could, but I've said before, and I, I think it's right on balance, given the fact that following on from that, Kristen Cole completely shifted sides. He's the person here who has the bad reaction, and he reacts like a, a spurned suitor. That's his reaction to me, that seems right, which feels to me as if Septon Eustace was probably more likely to be right there. Um, a third example we've got is um, talking about the who was the, the daddy of the Rhaenyra's three sons. Uh, Septon Eustace kind of hums and haws and sort of basically suggests this is Lainor because, you know, he's the husband, of course, uh, and then Mushroom says, no, of course not. This was Harwin Strong. I think on this one, we just have to go with Mushroom. It's, it's pretty obvious. I think from all the facts that we've got that, yes, these were uh, some strong boys. Um, these, This was, not, Lainor was gay. He, they, they, As far as we can tell, they never even slept together. So this is, uh, this is Mushroom in the right here. Um, and then we get... Um, uh, a couple of instances to do with Lane of Lauren's murder, uh, and then the fire at Harren Hall. So there were, there were a couple of accidents happened in very short uh, time. The in terms of Lane this being she was Rhaenyra's husband. Remember, he was killed by his lover. Eustace just sort of says, but this was just. Um, uh, friends bickering and it all just there was a bit of jealousy going on and uh, and it all got a bit out of hand mushroom thinks that this was a plot by Damon to get uh to kill lane so that he could marry Rhaenyra. um then there's also the fire at Harren Hall which killed Harwin strong Rhaenyra's uh, lover uh, as well as Lionel uh the Lord Eustace at this point, Eustace thinks that maybe it was Damon. Um, Mushroom thinks maybe it was Corliss. I I think both of these, it looks more like Damon. Uh, the, the things just, it's too coincidental that the three things had to happen in short, quick succession in order for Damon to get what he wanted, which was to marry Rhaenyra. Um, Damon's wife had to die. Rhaenyra's husband had to die, Rhaenyra's lover had to die. All three of those things happened, and then straight away, uh, Damon swooped in and uh, married her. So I go with the idea that that was Damon. So what does all this mean in terms of who should be trust? It depends on the situation, is the answer. Mushroom will almost always have the most salacious um uh, suggestions about what happened Eustace tends to be the more boring ones in life sometimes it's boring sometimes it's salacious and that I think is what George R. R. Martin is trying to show us here it's not we should always believe Mushroom it's more fun to believe Mushroom but it, the truth is sometimes one way sometimes another so that's my that's my take on who we should 
trust in this. Um, also, sometimes one or other of them actually have inside knowledge, but uh, not all the time. Okay, uh, I had a few questions in the chat. Let's see whether I can find them. Um, yeah, I can't actually. <laughs> oh, here we here we go. Um, question from Eric Harker saying, "Hello, Maester Robert. Do you know why George names the Tullys after Muppets during the dance? Kermit, Oscar, Elmo, and Grover. Does George love Sesame Street? George R. R. Martin has got a very silly sense of humour. Is is the answer to this? It's not that he particularly likes Sesame Street. Yes, he does name them uh, after those characters, and um, I suspect this was before." he realised that they were going to actually play quite a significant part in um, something that would be both in a book and then also in on the TV show. Uh, he may may have gone for less silly names if he'd, known, if he'd thought about that. But um, if you go back to book one, when Catelyn uh, captures Tyrion and they head off east to the Eyrie. She takes Bronn with her, but also three other sellswords. And the name of those sellswords, the names of those sellswords, um, he slightly tweaks it, but basically as Larry, Curly and Moe, who, uh, for those who don't know, this is old, I think they're black and white American comedy trio. Um, George R. R. Martin likes naming things after stuff that he likes. Um, there's um, a character at the Walter Patrick um, and 1-1. One, one. Um, this is named after some obscure American football reference that I, I don't truly understand, but he likes it. Um, George R. R. Martin has a very silly sense of humour and he often drops things in just to amuse himself, really. So it's not that he's a big fan of Sesame Street. He may well like Sesame Street, but he just enjoys putting in little, I suppose we could call them Easter eggs, but things to amuse himself. Trippy Fox uh, saying, Hi, Robert, love all your content. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, what is House of the Dragon most likely to visually or thematically parallel with the Game of Thrones show, with the Game of Thrones show, and do you see any specific references to the main A Song of Ice and Fire books? Okay, interesting question. In terms of um, visually or thematically paralleling, um, with the TV show, I think, I think the it, it's going to be the darker side of it. I think that what we will see is a lot of the sort of the gritty um, stuff that we had in, say, seasons two through to about four, maybe five, when Westeros has got wars going on all over the place where you get people trudging through the mud. Um, you get great bits of diplomacy and betrayal, the Red Wedding, things like that. That is the the sort of the thematic echo that we've got going on here a country at civil war a, a country where um everybody is losing out of this and the people who lose the most are the small folk other ordinary people and i that's certainly something that george R. R. martin does want us to see is it's the ordinary people he tells the story through the lens of the one percent but it's the ordinary people who suffer the most. And I think that that is something hopefully they will capture in um, uh, the House of the Dragon. In terms of uh, the sort of the, the second thing about any specific references to the main books, I think there will be a lot. Um, and they are, the, the way that George R. R. Martin tends to write these things is that he likes the idea of history rhyming. We see this again and again and again through A Song of Ice and Fire. Things 
echo down through the ages. So we will see a lot of things happening that echo through to the Song of Ice and Fire books. One of the things I think very strongly, I've talked about this before in King's Landing, when we have Rhaenyra, who takes over for six months and is queen for six months, and the taxes go up on the people and the people slowly turn against her and she eventually gets hounded out. I have a feeling that that is going to echo what happens with Cersei in The Winds of Winter. So um, th that's the kind of thing there'll be echoes. I think the Battle Above the God's Eye Lake is also going to be an echo, I think, going across... Um, so there will be lots of echoes sort of moving through this, uh, but it's the high level stuff. Uh, it's this is war, and at a as a final point here, I think what perhaps, and I don't know whether this will be a sort of a, a an attempt to sort of rev, sort of shift our perceptions for for the Targaryens, but. In the main Game of Thrones TV show, we, as an audience, we had quite a lot of sympathy for Danny. All the way through this, she, she was uh, portrayed very sympathetically. Um, that's partly the way that the the role was acted. Amelia Clark was has been very open that she she really liked the character and she had a lot of sympathy for the character, and so she played it in that way. Um, until the very end, season eight, we'll, we're not going to get drowned. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole of what happened in season eight. But the, the Targaryens as a whole and their their right to rule as a feel was put across in, in Game of Thrones. I think this will show the Targaryens at the height of their power and then try to remind us quite how much damage dragons can do quite how much the targaryens are very entitled people how they feel it is their right to rule it is their right to tell other people what to do and they will do that partly by showing us some targaryens who are not very sympathetic characters in fact um it will be very hard to find targaryen characters in this tv show who we do actually sympathise with and want to cheer on personally. So it's a sort of a corrective on the feel that a lot of us got from Game of Thrones. Um, question from Cloaked One, uh, picking up for Ebenezer Germa. Thank you very much. I uh, love it when people uh, do this, pick up for questions for other people. Very kind. Do you think the show will shoehorn characters from popular houses to appease Game of Thrones fans? Bit worried we might see an out-of-place Stark or Lannister. I don't think they're going to shoehorn them. Uh, so the Starks will appear. The Lannisters will appear. Um, I, I think there's there's a chance that they might bolster the roles of those houses um, a little bit because we know them, um, but I don't think they're going to shoehorn them in. So uh, what I mean by that is season one, we probably shouldn't see much of the Starks, realistically. The But we have in the trailer, we've already seen a Stark. They're bending the knee, effectively, pledging loyalty to Rhaenyra as heir to the throne in the flashback to the... Um, when Viserys made everybody acknowledge that she was his heir. So we've already seen a Stark there. And then the next time we should see a Stark is when Jacaris goes, flies all the way to the north and stops off at a few different places and basically makes deals to um, get them onto Team Black. Winterfell is one of the places that he went. Now, they should appear. That should happen. The Starks should be there. But I think the temptation will be to make that 
stretch out over a few episodes what happened at Winterfell rather than what they could do is just have him turn up, have a few bits of negotiations and then head away. There are rumours about what happened when, when they were up there that perhaps they might wish to pick up and make into storylines. Sarah Snow, for example. So that's what I think it is. I think that they will probably not shoehorn in extra. We won't suddenly find a Stark or a Lannister in the middle of the action when they shouldn't be there. But the bits where they should be there, I think that they might sort of just expand them out a little bit. But my hope is that by the later seasons, we have bought in enough and we understand, or the audience more broadly will have bought in enough that they they understand about House Hightower, they understand about House Flarion, and they don't need to go back to these other houses. Uh, they have bought into these... I say new houses. They're not new houses, but perhaps new for uh, viewers who have only seen Game of Thrones. Um, Andrew Kay agreeing that uh, Kristen Cole's abrupt shift and actions against uh, Rhaenyra suggest that he was rejected, uh, which makes sense given that Rhaenyra's pro uh, which makes sense given Rhaenyra's prospects at the time. Uh, yep, I would agree with that. Um, question from uh, Lucian saying, hi Robert, can you see any story details, dragons or characters from Fire and Blood being potentially omitted from the show, similar to Fagon and Victarion in Game of Thrones? Not, not really, I don't think. So Game of Thrones we well, A Song of Ice and Fire is big books that they had to crop down in order to uh, put them onto a TV show, um, or at least the length of TV show that they wanted to do. Fire and Blood is not that. Fire and Blood, we've got, I, I mean, I haven't counted the amount of pages, but it's a couple of hundred pages maybe in one book, which has to cover five seasons. So what we're more likely to see is adding things in than taking things out. So I don't think that we're going to see um, stuff coming. They might, So I mean, it pains me to say it, but they might exclude some characters like Mushroom, uh, or at least put him into the background because he's more of a sort of a book-type character than... Uh, actual in plot importance to what happened in the dance of the dragons um but no i can't that they're, they're not going to i would imagine take out any big elements certainly not in the same way that they they took out dawn or fagon or victorian really big significant things from a song of ice and fire they, they may if, if they think it's getting too big and broad and complicated, they may reduce down what happens with House Greyjoy or something like that, which is not that important, not that central. Yes, it's it plays a role, but it's not that central to what's going on. Um, your last great night, thank you very much, saying, how do you think the Valarions will impact the show? I love that they cast someone of colour for Corliss, and I'm sure it caused a stir. I think it will highlight that Rhaenyra's um, kids aren't actually Lainor's children. Yeah, so um, how will they impact on the show? I, I Hopefully in a huge way, because Corliss Valarion said it before, I'll say it again, he is a legend. This is how he should come across within the, this show. He is on his last legs, he's in his 70s by this point, but he he's travelled further than anyone else in Westeros ever. He's the richest man in all of Westeros. He's married the queen who never was. He's grandfather to uh, the heir apparent to the throne he should he's a legendary figure he should be bestriding this as this uh, person that when he walks into the room everybody should stop and pay attention to him so he, his role should be absolutely central then we've also got sort of all of the wider 
uh, Valarion clan with uh, his two children and then also his two probably bastards children, um, Adam and Alan. They will be hugely important. So as a whole, they should be um, absolutely central to what's going on. And also, I think his role, um, and I'm going to pick up on this a little bit later on the stream, but I see him as a character as being very clearly him and a couple of other people the longer the war goes on the more they just go you know what this is killing everyone we just have to end this now and they they turn from being warmongers to actually people who are trying pragmatically to bring about peace and that shift is vitally important in this so Although we often think about someone like Damon uh, as being, or Kristen Cole as being the real drivers of a lot, a lot of this action, and they are, the person or the people who are more important in the longer game are the people who managed to stop this war, because it could have carried on. It could very easily have carried on, and Corliss is central to that. So very important. Um, in terms of the highlighting that Rhaenyra's kids aren't actually Lenor's children. Yes. I think this is absolutely true. This is, so, uh, casting a person of colour as Corlys Velaryon um, means, as we got, we can see from behind, that guy in the middle there is Lenor. So he's, uh, he's the person who's married to Rhaenyra. Um, her kids do not look like him. They do not at all. They look like um, Harwin Strong. And the Strongs are big, broad, uh, muscly, dark hair, um, uh, pale skin. They are sort, basically sort of a northern house that happens to be in the south. That is what their look is. And this will very clearly show, and, and it is, it's a directorial decision or a showrunner decision to emphasize that because you could if you cast someone for for being lane or who looked quite similar to that it's just you know maybe slightly more valeriany then maybe the contrast wouldn't this is going to be very clear um and so that's going to make it very apparent to everyone that rainier's children are they are bastard children so it should have an impact, and it should be, be very visually obvious to um, to the audience. Um, Andrew Kay saying, really looking forward to Corliss's uh, own series, but yet one of the um, uh, one of the series that we know are in development. Um, is the Nine Voyages of Corliss Florence so when he was a younger man. Um, Kieran Grant saying, Lenor being light-skinned um, means that if he had a child with a white lady, the baby could look white. Yeah, so so what, what we're wanting, if, if we try and put ourselves into the minds of the showrunners, we're wanting this to, to look pretty obvious that this is not Lenor's child, but leave open enough of a... Uh, uh, possibility there that it it doesn't it's not ridiculous to say well these are my child my children with lane or that's what we're wanting so this is rainera should not look stupid as if everybody's laughing at her but it should be a an in joke that everybody knows really um is that me caught up in the chat oh a couple more uh brendan saying uh what were the, the Lannister? What were the Lannister game plans at this point? And could you talk about the reigns of Castamir? Um, yes. Well, the, the Lannisters. Uh, we we think of the Lannisters as being one of the big houses because obviously by the time Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, they are one of the big rich uh, houses. They're not at the time of the Dance of the Dragons. They are one of the top-tier houses, of course, but after House Targaryen, which is top, then the next three most powerful houses are House Hightower, House Velaryon, and House Baratheon. Then you get the others underneath that. And so the 
Lannisters are trying to push themselves up into that top rung. Now, what is their game plan? Well, they've got uh, Tylan Lannister there, who is on the um, uh, the Green Council. He's a very clever person, um, and he um, does seem to be a bit of a social climber, but at the same time works his way through and survives a huge amount. You have to feel a bit sorry for him towards the end. What is their game? They just got on the wrong side of this. Um, and where they end up as a house is, like most other houses, it has to be said, just licking their wounds. When House Lannister, they, they were forced to sort of bring their forces in to support the war effort. And then the Greyjoys started just attacking. And so they raided Lannisport. They raided the west coast of the Westlands. And House Lannister, basically, they shut themselves up in Casterly Rock and just let them, let the Greyjoys just raid away. It They didn't have, it doesn't look like they have a huge plan at this point. They, they just put in, threw in their lot with the wrong side, um, despite them generally appearing relatively competent through this, they, it just wasn't working for them. Uh, Jenny Bird saying, uh, hi Jenny, saying, I find Fire and Blood even more depressing than A Song of Ice and Fire. Is there anything good we will be able to take away from uh, House of the Dragon? Is there a good character like Brienne we can get behind in this series, or will we hate everyone by the end? Um, yeah, so this this links into a question from um, who was it? Uh, 440. No, was it? No, no, it wasn't. I can't remember who it was. I will find the question from one of my uh, patrons who was asking who uh, who the good characters are and who are the bad characters. I, um, in as much as you know, yes, George R. Martin obviously likes grey characters, but but where can we? Do, are there any good characters? Not many is the short answer. I, I, th I think we will grow to see um, some characters start off quite well. So Rhaenyra seems to start off, she's the realm's delight, uh, and she is in the right. She, she was the heir that was named by her father. Uh, she should have had the throne if they sort of gone with what um, the sort of natural law seems to imply, but. The longer you get into it, the less and less we kind of like her. Uh, she seems to uh, degenerate, understandably degenerate as a character. Uh, her children, one after another, all die. Um, she turns from being the realm's delight into somebody that everybody hates. Her husband appears to, she's lost his affections. Everything seems to be going wrong, and it's understandable. So she she turns from being a really quite good and sympathetic character. I th what I will say is that a lot of characters go through this, or like some are sort of going up or down. I would say there there aren't any. I mean, chat, please. If you if you can think of them, please do say main characters who are good. I would hold up someone like Lyman Beesbury as being probably a good character. Um, who has got a role in season one. Um, the actor that they cast for this is, is a very good character actor and comes across as being, he generally plays characters who are nice. You can't help but like them. You might not always 100% respect them, but they, they, they seem quite warm. He's the guy for those who... Uh, watched it. it was Fleabag's dad. If you ever watched Fleabag, so it's that that's the kind of feel I'm, get, I'm and getting. And he during the Green Council, he was the person who stood his ground and just sort of said, "No, I think this is right. I think we should be doing this rather than your coup attempt." So I think he's the kind of character that we will like. Some of the children, I think we might like to start with. Um, I think. Adam Valarion, we they could definitely play him as being a good character. He certainly he is loyal. He doesn't seem to do anything wrong. Um, so there are some, but it's the characters who come through it and decide, like Callus Valarion, by the end of it, 
I want peace. Those are the characters I think that we'll end up really liking as a whole. This is going to be darker than A Song of Ice and Fire. I think there's no two ways around that. And uh, pure good characters, the Briennes, there aren't really any out there. Um, Bill Patterson, thank you. Uh, somebody in the chat uh, uh, remembering his name of that actor. Um, Question from Caius Bellarina. Oh, thank you. Picking up for Freddie uh, McKellar saying, in the trailer, Eamon Targaryen has brown hair, but he actually has the Targaryen white hair. I'm confused. Um, also, watch Team IU. That's a detail I hadn't um, picked up on. So the trailer... Um, the... The, the children, the younger generation, weren't highlighted much in the the trailer. So I I personally, may, there may well be people who have, have got a much better eye than me for this kind of thing. I personally am not willing to 100%, but my, particularly for the younger versions of, of those characters, the very child, um, child actors, I'm not 100% able to point at some of them in the background and say yes that's definitely that character or that character um so i don't know is the is the honest answer on that one but in terms of what team are you um as with all of these things i'm not i don't i, I try not to take a team um i i'm my sympathies are with those who wish to end this war um which will probably come through over the course of uh covering uh the uh, the tv show that's where my sympathies lie um i think that team black were in the moral right to start with i, I think that is probably beyond dispute um it will be very interesting to see how they as showrunners how they balance this um, but by which i mean i don't think that they're going to have it as a an open and shut case of we go in there and everybody immediately is supporting team black and hating team green and all the way through it it's like can team black win can team black win i don't think that's how it i, I suspect we will get to the point of thinking Team Black may well be in the right, but Damon probably shouldn't be anywhere near the throne because he's a nasty piece of work. I have a feeling that that might be the route that they go down. Um... Right, okay, let's go to a uh, question from my patrons. Um, Lady Mays Mormont. Oh, actually, this was the question I was looking for a, a moment ago, uh, saying this is your first time asking a question. Well, welcome, congratulations. Um, would you mind rating where you imagine each important House of the Dragon character is on the good versus evil scale? Um, I understand George R. Martin likes a good mix, but if you had to choose. So I, I think I've covered that one just uh, a moment ago, so hopefully that answer's there. Um, and then you're saying, who is my favourite character, regardless of their good or bad scale? Um, well, from... <coughs> pardon me. From... Purely from Fire and Blood, the characters that I love, I don't know if I have a particular favourite. Larry Strong, I find fascinating, just trying to work out where he's coming from in all of this. I love Corlys Velaryon. I love um, uh, Miseria. I think she's going to be a fascinating character. Um, and Damon, I don't think you can take your eyes off of Damon. Um, so those are the characters that I'm going into this really enjoying. Um, the the kind of characters that I was enjoying reading about. Now it will be fascinating to see whether that is still the case in the TV show or whether the other characters will come to the fore. For I think, I think I will still be fascinated by Miseria. I think that she looks like a really intriguing character from the little we've seen of her so far. I'm really looking forward to Matt Smith's performance. He should get this one right. Um, uh, the the character that George R. R. Martin has picked out, though, this was in the same blog post I was talking about earlier, is Viserys and um, the Paddy Considine who plays him. And he, he picked him out specifically saying, this is 
an instance where actually some combination of the writing and the actor has made this better than how I wrote the character. And when that comes from George Romero, I think that's high praise. Uh, I was very excited when I saw Paddy Considine was cast, if you think back 18 months ago or whenever it was, uh, I said at the time, I thought that was the one that they nailed it. I thought, yes, he can pull off that character. Um, and it sounds like he has. So I I think we will... Um, uh, I think we will get a lot from that character, and I think we will appreciate that character. And and I think I, I'm trying to think of the the phrase George R. R. Martin as something like tragic majesty. And I do wonder whether we will. Most people look at Viserys and just think, well, he's a weak ruler, but maybe we will see him as actually a good person. I don't know. It will be very interesting to see how that interpretation goes. Akaris Ballerina saying, why still no purple eyes? Viewers accept magic now. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think they've just abandoned that idea uh, for the TV show. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's much more I can say about that one. Um, the, the purple eyes thing, uh, I, it was something, and I can't even remember all the details, but it was something as simple as uh, Amelia Clark's couldn't put in the contact lenses to have the purple eyes so they decided just to not do that um and then they haven't felt the need to have purple eyes since then so why should they introduce them for this it would be good i would have liked it but i personally it's quite a small point i think um it's a shame but um what are you gonna do Sarah, awesome source, thank you very much, saying, do you think Damon would have been satisfied to have his children with Ray, with Rhaenyra behind her strong bastards in the line of succession? Had the Blacks prevailed, um, I don't think he would have allowed a strong to take the Iron Throne. I, I mean, I've thought about this too. So as a default for Damon, he's a fascinating character, but as a default for Damon, if you wish to try and interpret what he's doing and why, if the question you ask yourself is, does this get Damon closer to the throne? That is a reasonable uh, motivation every single time. To start with, he thinks that he is the heir. He thinks that um, the fact that Rhaenyra is the, is um, uh, as a woman means that he, as the the next male in line, he should be inheriting. Uh, he should be succeeding as king. Uh, and he even, uh, when Viserys has a son who tragically dies after a day, he's even there toasting the the death of this child because he thinks this means that he's still going to be king when it turns out that Rhaenyra is has been um, made the heir then he starts trying to get close to uh, Rhaenyra um, then uh, after uh, lots and lots of um, sort of setbacks he manages to get himself back into favor by marrying into the Valarion family which gets him closer but then he's also seemingly wooing Rhaenyra again and then oh string of accidents happen his wife dies her husband dies her lover dies he then marries her and she's the heir to the throne now so he will then be uh, the prince consort that gets him back very close to the throne um, so again and again, you think is his actions seem to be about getting him closer to the throne. Um, would he have allowed her strong children to be um, inheriting? I th it's speculation. I think that there's a chance that they might have had accidents. Um, we don't know. Uh, but I think that there's a there's a very strong chance that he might have wanted his children to be taking over. Um, reflective rambling, picking up for extra, saying, why is Kristen Cole with the High Towers when he's a Kingsguard 
and should be sworn to King Viserys and his successors, aka Rhaenyra. Okay, so he he is with the King's Guard, and he becomes Rhaenyra. This is way back in time. Um, he becomes Rainier when Rainier is just a child. He becomes Rainier's favorite, and she basically says, "Can I have this guy as my personal bodyguard out of the King's Guard?" And the King says, "Yeah, why not?" Uh, and this is not unusual. The, with the King's Guard, they would yes, they're there guarding the King, but they also um, some of them get attached to the heir. Some of them, some of them get sort of uh, their guarding the the queen it's it's not just the seven of them in a circle around the king they they get distributed to look after the the royal family so this is why Rhaegar had a couple it was it was deemed normal for Rhaegar to have a couple of king's guard who would be um there with him because he was the heir to the throne so that was the situation originally he was sort of set aside to be looking after the heir to the throne then he came the incident that we talked about earlier, and he broke sides with her. So he was still a member of the King's Guard, but no longer her champion, no longer there protecting her personally. And instead, he attached himself to Alicent, who was the Queen. And again, this is this is reasonable this is not unexpected the fact that he was the lord commander does normally seem to imply that he should have been by the um the king himself but uh that's uh, viserys was quite weak when it came to alicent and rhaenyra he just wanted them to get on and everything to be okay so um yeah it's um it's unusual, but not out of bounds. Um, e. Marty saying, have you considered dragon hatching is tied to certain Targaryens women being present? Maybe childbirth or motherhood and genetics. Um, yeah, so, so dragon, dragons being born, being hatched, this is one of those things you kind of have to read between the lines because it, we're not told much about the way that this happened. It's just it just seemed to happen in the same way that um, animals have babies, um, dragons sometimes the eggs hatched, and it happened most often on Dragonstone. They it seemed that seemed to be a good place for them to be having uh that for the dragons hatching but not always at dragonstone um so it doesn't seem to have been you can try and trace around are there any particular factors which make it um more or less likely that they will hatch and there doesn't seem to be much to be honest uh so the idea um uh, a dragon hatching being tied to uh, Targaryen women, birth or motherhood and genetics. It does. I mean, it, a lot of the time there are women present, but at the same time there are a few times when we just read and some some eggs were hatching on Dragonstone, and it's like. We're not told that's because there were women around uh, at that uh, particular time. I mean, it's it's bet easier to argue that it's to do with women being there than men because the women do seem to be a quite constant presence uh, around the dragons. But um, I personally, I don't think I don't think so. I think it's just they would hatch as as normal. Um, Let's go to um, Zakalok saying, Bonjour, Robert. Bonjour. How do you think they will treat Silverwing's case in House of the Dragon? Silverwing, um, I don't know when you're saying how they would treat the case, but I'll, I'll give the 
overview of the Silverwing story. Silverwing being a dragon. This is Queen, Good Queen Alison's dragon. She dies before this. And um, Silverwing, at the beginning of the Dance of the Dragons, is just on Dragonstone. Has made a little lair in one of the caves and is sort of living out its middle age um, quite happily without a rider. I think that they will stick with that. I think purely in terms of CGI budgets, special effects budgets for season one, if they can have as few dragons as possible, I think they'll be very happy with that. So I don't think they need to show those dragons that happen to be hiding away in Dragonstone. Uh, so we won't be introduced to Silverwing, I suspect, until we get to the dragon seeds. And the dragon seeds probably won't happen until season three, maybe, would be my guess. When we get the dragon seeds, people try to um, uh, bond with these dragons. Someone does manage to bond with Silverwing. That's Ulf White. Uh, Ulf White rides Silverwing um, successfully for a year or so before um, uh, he and Hugh Hammer turn sides, turn cloaks at the Tumbleton. So then Ulf White dies, is killed, basically. What happens to Silverwing? Silverwing survives. Um, and then after sort of flying around for a little bit, Tumbleton is basically a horrific massacre. If you're looking at terrible, this is war at its worst, Tumbleton should be that. Um it, basically, Silverwing just flies off and ends up in on an island in Red Lake and is not really seen from again. So how will they handle Silverwing? I think just like that. I don't think they will show anything special. Um, I think that Silverwing will appear in, say, Season 3 with the Dragon Seeds, um, be flown around by Alf White for a bit, and then after Alf White dies... Silverwing will fly off. Um, AK Channel TV saying, who is the best warrior at this time? That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, I, it, it's quite hard to say. Uh, it's, it's hard to <laughs> establish exactly who is the best warrior during something like A Song of Ice and Fire, where we've got lots of evidence. We've got a lot less evidence um, here uh, for who the best warrior is. Uh, Kristen Cole was very successful in um, tourneys, so he clearly is a very strong warrior. Um, we also have uh, the likes of, I mean, in terms of dragon riders, Damon was was uh, there, and also Aemond, very strong. The the strongs, though. Um, as I'm talking about Strong, um, Harwin Strong was very clearly a very powerful fighter as well. So there are there are a few contenders, but they will probably build up someone like Kristen Cole as being one of the most um, impressive fighters, non non dragon riding fighters. Um, Uh, and Kieran Grant just saying Kristen Cole or Bold John Roxbury. Yep, that's uh, that's possible too. Um, question from Lady Maze Mormont saying, do you think the Dance of the Dragons is what caused the High Towers to be less a part of the modern story? For instance, maybe they've become sort of isolationists as much as anything. Uh, Give Dan some love from my dogs. Thank you so much for everything you do. When I say you have literally saved my life, I mean it. Um, and I, I don't I don't really know how to respond to that. I've no idea what you mean, but those words are very kind. Thank you very much. And if I've in any way helped um, helped you, then that means a lot. Thank you for saying it. Um, in terms of the high towers, uh, and every blessing to you as well, by the way. Uh, in terms of the high towers, the I personally I think that I would view what happened with the high towers during the dance of the dragons as an aberration from general high tower policy over millennia high tower policy over millennia is they stick to old town 
they stick to playing politics behind the scenes they stick to uh, influencing things through the maesters through uh, septons the faith that is the way that they've always worked um they've not really tried to push on and take control over bigger areas the seven kingdoms itself um Otto and Alicent Hightower are the aberrations in this. So afterwards, yes, they're left licking their wounds uh, a bit. Um, most of the major houses in uh, Westeros afterwards are licking their wounds, having to repair themselves. But I think this is just a reversion back to the mean, reversion back to where they were before. Uh, a, a, the policy which has carried on through to the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, the time of A Song of Ice and Fire, when they are rich, powerful, influential, but sticking to um, their own world, their own space, their own city, rather than an intervening in politics in King's Landing. Um, Zakalok saying, how will they treat the various or numerous tourneys that occurred during Viserys's reign? Um, well, I, I think the way that lots of tourneys happened, um, I, I think we read of at least five or six um, just in that period of time. Um, there will have been even more. It's just those are the ones where things happen. How will they treat them? Well, we've seen from the trailer... Uh, they're going to show at least one of them. We see people jousting. We see um, when um, Kristen Cole and Damon fought in the melee. Uh, what I wonder is whether they're going to just squash those together. They're just going to conflate those um, into one or two tourneys rather than uh, have... A t different tourney per episode over a, a 10 episode season i think maybe they will just have one or two tourneys to try and um show what happened in particular the important one will be the one with the greens and the blacks um as in where we get uh, alicent wearing green and rainera wearing black and red so that they will definitely show they may try and push a few of the different events into that um that were not there before i don't know i don't think they want this to be just about tourneys so they're not going to just be talking about tourneys but there will definitely be tourneys in there um Diego Godoy saying, hola, Robert, hola. What do you think will be the most shocking moments of the TV show? For me personally, reading Blood uh, reading blood and Cheese took my breath away, uh, similar to seeing the fight of the mountain versus Oberyn. What other moments do you think will have that touch of gruesome and unexpected violence? Pardon me. Um, so I think you're right. Blood and Cheese will be the red wedding moment of this tv show this will be the the moment when it just turns into something horrific and horrible um and for people who haven't read the book it will it will just blow their minds i am sure that that that's everybody's red fire and blood blood, blood and cheese it yeah <laughs> It's horrible. There are other moments that will also be pretty gruesome. Off the top of my head, the butcher's ball, you can, if you just imagine uh, the situation, the for those who haven't read it or can't remember, Kristen Cole and his army are heading back from Harrenhal, back through the Riverlands. They go through this very long slow march and they find a uh, come across a whole load of dead bodies that have been sort of arranged out um as 
Yeah. yeah, as if they're having a feast or something like that, and it's like, oh, this is horrible. They keep on going. There's another whole load of dead bodies, uh, sort of all arrayed out. This is horrible. They come again, keep going. There's another load. By this point, they're just they're ignoring all of these dead bodies, but this time, these aren't dead bodies. These are actual soldiers playing dead who suddenly jump up and start attacking them, and it it. It's just butchery. That will be horrible if you can just you could imagine the staging of that. Um, I think Tumbleton, the way it's described, should be this is the horrors of war. This is how George R. R. Martin writes it. I, whether they're going to show us that, I don't know uh, because it's not really central to the plot. It's just uh, this is what's happening to the normal people because some really nasty people are camped outside. Um, soldiers with nothing better to do, just destroying the lives of the people in the city. So those are there. In terms of set pieces, though, I think that the the battles where we have dragons fighting other dragons will be some of the most memorable. Um, the the first uh, one over Shipbreaker Bay, that will be significant, but the one which I think is going to stick with us is the battle over the god's eye when we have Aemond and Daemon uh, facing each other. Um, ah, D uh, Divine Charaka saying Daemon versus Aemond over the god's eye uh, could beat the Red Wedding if they execute it well. The VFX must outdo themselves on that scene. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, it, it, it should it, this should be the pinnacle. That one I would say of the actual dance the actual the dragons fighting each other that should be the moment that we we had a few bits of it in season eight of game of thrones dragons fighting each other but almost blink and you miss it this is a proper fight with the two characters who are perhaps the most charismatic characters on both sides finally meeting each other on two of the most deadly um, uh, dragons that there are. And this is, it, it, it should be a proper show. This is like a season finale kind of stuff. Um, and they collide and we should be able to see what happens with the two of them. And it's bas basically killing each other and the whole thing. It should be amazing. So uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Cloaked one saying proper fight came across very British and I'm here for it. I can't help it. Uh, I am proper British. Uh, Johnny Targs uh, talking about a special shout out to your moderators, first of all. Uh, yes, absolutely. I always uh, try and do this. Moderators, you do a fantastic job. Thank you so much. If you are watching this live, uh, if you're in the chat and if you're enjoying the chat, the moderators are the people there. Um, protecting you from the spam bots and making sure that the uh, the chat just keeps going in a very positive and, and uh, hopefully enjoyable way. So if you are there in the chat, please uh, throw a little bit of love to the, the moderators. They do a fantastic job. Um, and uh, while I'm pausing just to do a few little thanks and uh, general parish notices, um, Reminder, Saturday over on Twitter, I'm going to give it a go. I will do a uh, an hour, 9 o'clock my time, which is 4 o'clock um, Eastern time. I will do, I'll just be sitting on Twitter answering questions about where we're at on the Rings of Power and specifically when I had a chance to talk to the showrunners and ask them some questions, what they said. So if you're interested in that, go over there. You can find me... Uh, indie geek over on twitter um what else should i say patrons thank you um hugely appreciate you um they're one of the reasons why i prioritize patrons questions is because i can't do what i do without your support so thank you very much indeed um if you would like to support this channel the very best way to do that is via patreon there is a link um i don't know if i put the description in yet but if you're watching this back a little bit later down there will be appearing a link to my patreon page um there's extra benefits for patrons over there as well okay uh i think that's all let's get straight back into um 
the uh, questions. Um, Johnny Targs uh, saying, I have a theory that Kristen Cole at some point began a romantic relationship with Alison Hightower. Curious to see if you think this is a possibility from your point of view. I, I like this. I don't know is the short answer. And I don't think we've got the evidence from the book to say that this is the case. Um, but it's possible. I don't think we can rule this out. So basically he did um, very much uh, shift his affections from Rhaenyra across to Alicent. And it isn't just, uh, I don't like Rhaenyra anymore. Uh, what, what do I do now? Nothing. He definitely took Alicent's side. Now, this might be just because he hates Rhaenyra so much that he has to be on the opposite side, possibly. Um, but would Alicent have seen the opportunity to to get the Lord Commander of the King's Guard on her side, maybe. I mean, we don't get the evidence for it, but as theories go, it, it works for me. It does work for me. 444, um, talking about, uh, first of all, you're talking about the, the different versions of the story. I and the handling of that, I think I've covered that bit already. Um, but also you're asking about the genetics of dragon bonding. I have imagined uh, from a long time that Targary the Targaryen ability to make a bond with a dragon is simple um, Mendelian genetics, where, pardon me, dragon bonding ability is a dominant um, allele, and pure blood Targaryens have two dominant alleles. Uh, this is sort of a... Uh, bit of genetics or a gene basically um with every generation of outside valyrian marriage more and more recessive alleles were in the gene pool resulting in dragon bonding abilities to be less frequent so um yes i i, I think it does seem to be something like that um but what would i say is First of all, I think we have to accept the fact that this idea of pure Valyrian or pure Targaryen isn't necessary because, uh, which it, from what you're saying, you would also say it's not necessary. But Danny, who we think of as being pure ish Targaryen, is, if you look back in her family tree, at best one eighth Targaryen because her family, um, we get Blackwoods and others who sort of marry into it at various different times. It's, she's at best one eighth Targaryen. So, uh, but she seemed to have no problems at all bonding with her dragon. What seems to be the case is there, there's, there is some genetic element here, but that I think is not the entire answer. It's also a matter of um, how you approach this. So Danny, she was the mother of dragons. She was there. She fed them. She was with them all the time. She cre created a bond from the start. And that's a thing that uh, the Targaryens seem to instinctively know. So this idea of putting a dragon egg into a cradle, the idea there was that the dragon, right from a very early age, they would form a bond. So this idea of bonding is not just about you can bond uh, because you've got the genetics for it. It's about trying to encourage it because you get close. And this is the message seemingly of Nettles, is that Nettles probably... Uh, when she was bonding with Sheep Stealer, probably to start with, would not have been able to bond with Sheep Stealer, but managed to do it through slowly building a bond of trust, giving sheep to the dragon that likes to eat sheep, each time getting a little bit closer, each time getting a little bit friendlier, until eventually they trusted one another. So that can be contrasted to. Um, if you go to Quentin Martell in the main story and he he goes in there thinking, I've got some Targaryen blood in me, which he does. Uh, he, indisputably, it is there. Um, 
but he thinks he should just be able to go in to where the dragons are and sort of claim a dragon with a whip. That's not how this works. I think that there was probably every chance, if he had very slowly over time gained the trust of one of the dragons, maybe he could have bonded with a dragon, but he just went about it completely the wrong way. So um, that's a slightly roundabout way of saying that I think you're right that there is one element of this is definitely to do with is the Targaryen or the Valyrian strain of um, dragoniness there. And the less Targaryen or the less Valyrian you are, then the less um, likely uh, you are to have both. You, you're, you talk about there um, uh, having two parts to, to this, less likely to have two parts to this within your genetic uh, makeup. I think that's right. But there's another element as well, which is to do with the actual bonding between a human and the dragon. Um, uh, Scott of Costly Rock saying, according to Dan and Dave, one eighth is too much. Um, yeah, well, OK, fair enough. Um, Tyler... Barnhart saying, um, in fact, no, I missed one. Catherine Furseth, uh, let's go back to there, saying, Hi, Robert, how did foreign powers such as Bravos, the other free cities, the Iron Bank, etc., align themselves during the Dance of the Dragons? What was the foreign policy of the Greens and the Blacks, if they had any? And how did the other foreign powers view the two sides fighting in Westeros? Um, okay, so um, there is not a huge amount of involvement from foreign powers within the Dance of the Dragons. From the most part, most of the um, other uh, city-states and powers just largely ignored it. Some, because they're just so far away it doesn't matter to them at all. So Meereen and people in Slaver's Bay, that's so far away that by the time they heard news that the Dance of the Dragons was happening, it was probably drawing to a close. That doesn't matter. The Dothraki don't care about it at all. It's really the only people that really um, would care about this are the free cities. So how did they uh, interact with it? Well, the the key point here in terms of foreign policy for the greens and the blacks is that the greens under otto hightower actively tried to use the free cities to get onto their side to help them win otto hightower first of all um the this is Tylen lannister as the um um, master of coin he split up the the crown treasury into four parts one part went to the iron bank of bravos so uh th that was a sort of a general involvement of bravos bravos as a whole kept out of it they, they had a few bits of involvement here and there ships going to and fro but broadly speaking they did not get involved the people who did and the other people who did not get involved incidentally we don't think of them as a foreign power because uh, we, we're coming at it from a Song of Ice and Fire lens, but Dawn. Dawn, uh, Otto Hightower tried to get Dawn, who were not part of the Seven Kingdoms at the time, onto his side, and they basically just said no. But there was uh, a battle, a long ongoing battle for the Stepstones, which are the small rocks, islands that stretch between Dawn and the disputed lands over in uh, Essos. Now, earlier on in the backstory to the Dance of the Dragons, Daemon and Corlys Velaryon had fought this war against the Triarchy, which are the three um uh, free cities in the disputed lands um to take the stepstones to the extent that daemon targaryen got himself crowned as the king of the stepstones and the, he made a lot of enemies in the triarchy at the time 
Otto Hightower was a very able politician and his thought was, well, we can try and get the triarchy on our side. They hate Damon. They want the stepstones for themselves. They won't want war because this is bad for trade. So he invited them to join onto his side and said, well, you can have the stepstones if you want to, and you get a chance to uh, to attack Damon, which I know you hate, um, who I know you hate. And he sent out these letters. Ironically, he was his success. It worked. They did join. Uh, they, they agreed to do it. But ironically, he didn't really get the credit for it because he got deposed by... Um, so Aegon II basically got bored of waiting and said, Otto Hightower, you're not doing it. You're just writing letters to people. This isn't war. You're not winning. You're not winning the war. Uh, so he, he got rid of Otto Hightower as Hand of the King, replaced him with Kristen Cole. Kristen Cole goes and charges off to, to Harrenhal, being a man of action. Uh, but finally, the triarchy decides, you know what, we'll, we'll do it. And so the triarchy then send their um, fleet up, and they. It's a crucial moment in the uh, the bat the war, because a few things happen. First of all, they manage they stumble across the ship which is trying to take um, a couple of uh, Team Black, uh, their basically their heirs over to safety in uh, Essos. This is um, Aegon, who will become Aegon the Third, and Viserys. Uh, Aegon manages to survive and escape. Viserys seemingly gets lost. Everybody thinks he's dead until well after the Dance of the Dragons, when he suddenly turns up, having been uh, mysteriously hiding away in the Free Cities, and arrives back with a wife um, and, and all grown up. But that's a story for after the Dance of the Dragons. The, the first big victory for the Dragon Seeds was to take on this fleet, and they won. But the fleet on returning home stopped off and basically raised uh, Driftmark to the ground, or Spice Town, which, uh, which was this uh, the, the capital there. And high tide which was the castle and this is important because house of larion had been the richest family the richest house in westeros but after that they were not their their money which was all there had was taken was destroyed their riches scattered they lost a third of their fleet. House Valarion got um, taken down from being hugely important to, sli to slightly less powerful. Still important and powerful, but nowhere near what they used to be. And the House Valarion did not regain that strength again, ever. So uh, they this was an important um, moment in the war, and it's often overlooked, but because the Traki came in, lost the battle, and then went back home again. And that was pretty much it. And it feels like they didn't do much, but they had a huge impact on uh, sort of the longer-term fortunes of that war. Um, Caius Bellarina picking up for Commando Gregor. Some theorise that Corliss is part Summer Islander, adding to his seafaring talents. Do you think the show will use this explanation? Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't... The thing with Corliss is that we don't... George R. Martin doesn't give us a huge history background to him. We don't... I don't think we even really know his parents' names. We're told that he inherited from his grandsire, so there's a bit of a mystery going on there. Um, will they give background to who he is, uh, whose parentage is, I don't think they need to, uh, personally. I think I think they can just put it in there. This is who he is. So um, 
I think the answer is no. I mean, if if they feel they have to, then they could drop it in there. But it's more likely, I think, for the uh, the nine voyages. If that does get commissioned, then I think that they will probably then want to give him more of a backstory. Now, I think they for this TV show, I think it's uh, showing him, introducing him as a fully fledged uh, older guy. Um, his his parentage isn't the issue here. Um, it's who he is and what he's done that's important. When we have nine voyages, that's going to be when who he is um, uh, becomes important. Um, Cloaked One picking up question for Tripster36 saying, Hi Robert, do you predict any character will be like Jamie Lannister and have the audience dislike them but eventually come to like them a lot, or vice versa? Um, oh, interesting one. So I think you know, is that, are there any characters who we might dislike and then grow to like? I mean, I, I will throw this one to the chat, I think, because this is I'm sure somebody will come up with a, uh, a good one for this. But I, I do wonder whether we might, there might be some characters if we, it's not that we sort of start disliking them, but um, I think we might, they might lose our sympathy a bit. So Rhaenyra, is a classic example, I think, of somebody who we will start out completely rooting for, and then that will get muddied quite a lot the deeper in we go. I wonder whether someone like Alicent, they might do it slightly the other way around. Certainly the way that George R. R. Martin writes her at the end, we're invited to feel sorry for her in her last years. Uh, and with details like the fact that she she never wore she hated the color green she never wore green again just implies very strongly she just regrets everything she hates what happened and i think that we will come from a place where we're seeing her as being this kind of power hungry person to at the end we will feel quite sympathetic towards her feel quite sorry towards her so um that i think is um, possible i wonder someone like laris strong the reason why i love him is that his motivations are never 100 percent clear i wonder whether they will show by the end that he has been trying to work for the good of the realm and therefore we might grow to actually appreciate him. I think that we will get to the point where those people who want peace are the people we're cheering for uh, towards the end. Um, and I think possibly the other person that we might grow to like or sympathize more, Miseria, who when she first arrives, um, on the scene is she's a mistress of whispers she seems to be the person who organizes things like blood and cheese um, she seems to be there rooting out people who will then get um, uh, brutalized and uh, tortured there's a fair chance we won't like a lot of what she does but I when I was on my last reread of Fire and Blood, I started to get the impression that she truly loved Daemon Targaryen. And she was happy. She understood that he was a complex character. But at the very end, the person who betrays him, the person who basically tells Rhaenyra that uh, Nettles should die and he's a traitor, is Miseria. She's the person who says he's sleeping with Nettles. So that makes me feel that uh, something happens with Damon. This isn't a Damon stream. We can cover it at some point. But something happens with him that he does seem to change his motivations right at the end of his life, connected with the time that he spends time with Nettles. And I think that the just the plain text reading of it is that Miseria 
realizes that he now loves nettles not her and that's why she betrays him and i think that we will then go from a situation where uh we see her as just being this really brutal character somebody that we have some sympathy for because we actually feel a little bit sorry for interesting question though um i don't know if there's any uh let me have a quick uh look in the chat uh carl karsnark saying she looks uh nice and spooky in the trailers great outfit um uh, seeing if there's any other characters here that people think that we will like um the real yt saying not being a book reader i hope that Kristen cole will be badass in the show um yeah i think Christian Cole's an interesting one. I think we might start by liking him, but by the end we might dislike him. Thailand, yes, good. I I, th I certainly grew to love Thailand as the as we go through it. He starts off quite sort of a minor character in a while, but by the very end, I liked him a lot. But his, by the very end, it was more moving on beyond the story of the Dance of the Dragon. So maybe we won't quite get that um, far, so we won't actually see. Um, uh, all of his, I mean, I think redemption is probably the wrong word, but his wisdom towards the end. Um, lots of people suggesting Damon as a character that we will start to start hating and then grow to love. Um, Red Smith saying, this is my first live. Welcome. Um, uh, love your videos. Content is the reason I decided to read the Song of Ice and Fire books. Well, um, that makes me very happy. I love it when people uh, pick up the books uh, because of uh, you know, I've inspired them in some way. Um, I've just finished them and Duncan Egg, and I'm halfway through Fire and Blood. Well, excellent. That's um, uh, great stuff. Uh, after you've done that, Lord of the Rings. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's a lot. Oh, actually, you've got the World of Ice and Fire to go as well, uh, just to complete the set of um, uh, the Song of Ice and Fire books. Um, yeah, so a lot of people are saying, um, Damon, um, that maybe we'll grow to love Damon towards the end. Um, Reflective Rambling saying, I almost wonder if Miseria was Rhaenyra's lover as well. Uh, she was totally chill with the affair and became very quick to trust her over her husband. Yeah, interesting. Um, it's possible. It's possible. We don't really... The thing about Miseria in, in the book is that she's always in the background. We don't see much of her. So it's possible. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting uh, idea. Um, uh, Jasmine L saying my first live as well. Uh, so welcome. If, if this is your first time, um, watching live, then it's a very different experience. I, I think to, uh, watching these back. Uh, so welcome. Uh, fantastic to see you. Let's go to a question from Tyler. Uh, Barnhart saying, given the fact that the, uh, song verse and fire is heavily influenced by real world history. Uh, brackets historian here. Uh, what do you think are some real world inspirations or parallels for the Dance of the Dragons? Uh, I can understand the Wars of the Roses. I also see a parallel to the American civil rights movement and other movements that want to advocate for the rights of the oppressed or discounted groups or persons. Um, curious as to anybody else's thoughts. I'll probably be jumping into the stream late as I work. Um, well, if you're, I, I, I put this one towards the end of the stream because uh, as you say you, you won't get to be there so I don't know whether you're watching now but I, I'll very happily answer this because I think there is a very very strong parallel I don't know if George R. R. Martin has specific I think he has specifically said uh, that um, the the parallel is intentional but it's it's too strong for it not to be and this is a period of time in English history called the anarchy and this is uh, way back in the sort of the Plantagenet era uh, of um, rule. So after the Normans had come, they'd established themselves there. Um, it's during the period, if you've ever read Cadfile, the Cadfile books or seen, uh, they, there were some excellent um, uh, TV shows with Derek Jacobi, I think, as, as Cadfile. Um, 
slight digression. But during this time, uh, we start with Henry the First on the throne, and Henry the First is our Viserys figure, and he decides that the person he wants to inherit is Matilda. Now, Matilda is obviously a woman, um, but this goes against what a lot of people think should happen. But he's he's insistent, and he gets all of his barons and people there, and he gets them all to swear loyalty to Matilda and say that after he's gone, then Matilda's going to take over. We can already start to see the parallels. Matilda, however, is out of the country. I think she's in France, out of the country, when Henry dies. And what happens is that there's this guy called Stephen who thinks that actually he should be, he's the first male in line, he should actually be king. And he rushes to London, gets himself crowned and declares himself king. Meanwhile, Matilda hears about this and is aghast, but I should be ruling. And she then, she's off the mainlands, but she gathers together her loyal subjects and then heads in and starts taking, starts a sort of a, a counter-revolution. And then we have civil war and the country is sort of rent into parts of it, uh, recognising Stephen as king, parts of it recognising um, Matilda as queen. There is a time that the, the actual war pans out slightly differently to what happens in um the dance of the dragons but there is a time when she pronounces herself queen and is sort of generally recognized over most of the country as being queen but she gets written out stephen is on the throne and writes her out of history she's not if you look back at the list of rulers of of england she's not there it's just stephen who's the king stephen there um, but although Stephen prevails and he becomes king, he is only a king for a short period of time. And he actually has as his heir Henry II, who is Matilda's son, which mirrors what happens at the end of the Dance of the Dragons, where Aegon II does end up on the throne, but is only there for a short period of time. And his heir, Aegon III, who is the son of Rhaenyra, Rhaenyra being Matilda. So that is the very clear historical parallel that George R. R. Martin has used for this. It's called the Anarchy. It's a fascinating bit of history. Um, Matilda was a really interesting character as well. Do dig into that. So um, uh, yeah, it's. I think George R. R. Martin has acknowledged it, but the similarities are so close that it, it's it's not just a coincidence. Uh, Jill Nelson, thank you so much for the uh, super sticker. I'm That's looking like an avocado laughing. Um, I don't always understand these super stickers, but thank you. I really appreciate them. Um, Morgan Holmes saying, best ending ever. Damon kills one eye, falls into the water, almost drowning. Nettles jumps in and saves him and then flies off with him uh, with Sheep Stealer. Um... Yes, uh, I love it. My take, though, is that he doesn't survive. Um, he So Nettles heads off into the Mountains of the Moon. Basically, Damon, yeah, he kills Aemon, but he seems to, that seems to be his plan from the beginning was to fall to his death and kill Aemon on the way down. And we know this because of the fact, and we're told, George R. Martin specifically tells us, that Aemon um, strapped himself into his dragon with the chains that were there, but Daemon did not. We're specifically told that before the battle. Why did he not? So that he could leap from his own dragon and attack Aemon. That was, that was his plan all along. Daemon went there to to kill Aemon and to die himself in the effort. It's the bit of dialogue we have is um, Aemon saying, you have lived too long, uncle. And Daemon says, on that, we agree. Daemon thinks he's lived too long and Daemon is happy to end his life at that point. So, I think all the evidence goes to suggest he was expecting to die 
and we do get contacts with nettles later and there's no indication that damon is there at all so i i love the idea of of it it would be a very happy ending the two of them uh living a happy life uh away from all of the trappings of power just them but i don't think in reality it happened um that's uh so i think that's me caught up in the chat for the moment let's go to i've got a couple more questions from my patrons and then i shall i'll try and dig through uh, a lot of uh, the chat there's some i can see there's some excellent uh, thoughts and comments coming up in the chat i'll try and get through as much of that as we can uh mara lee thank you so much um i saw you did a super chat before we went on air just a show of love and support hugely appreciate that you know how much i appreciate your support uh mara so thank you um just asking uh, questions about the show what days will the show appear on? Will it be on Sundays or on a different day? And also, how will I be covering it? Uh, will it be each episode like with Game of Thrones? And is that also how I'm going to do the Rings of Power? So um, the short answer is uh, we haven't got all of the details from HBO, but 21st of August um, is a, uh, a Sunday. So the working assumption is that this is going to be the same as they did for Game of Thrones. Why, when you've got a winning formula, why change it? So it's my best guess is it's going to be 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, on the Sunday so that everybody can go into work on the Monday morning, chat about it. That's the idea, I think, that they, they've got. Um, as for Rings of Power, when that's going to be on, that's probably... Uh, again, we've not been told uh, exactly when it's going to be, but if they do it the same thing they did for the Wheel of Time, then it will come on on a Thursday, US time, about this this period, about this sort of time, actually. Uh, so, um, yeah, two hours into a live stream. So uh, what I would probably do for Rings of Power is just keep these live streams and have them as a as a pre-show uh, live stream and just keep it to an hour and 50 or something like that so everyone can go off, make a cup of tea and then sit down and watch it. What my plan is for um, covering um, the uh, House of the Dragon is I will do episode by episode breakdowns as I did for Game of Thrones. I will do this uh the breakdown done within 24 hours of the show so you can watch the show and then go straight off and, and watch my breakdown um i will do that for both shows for the rings of power as well probably a pre-show stream um normally unfortunately being the side of the atlantic post-show streams are not a very um sociable hour for me so i tend to do a pre-show stream rather than the post-show stream um and then i will try and do some other things um I haven't worked out my full plan yet. I'm going to work out my full plan at some point in the next couple of weeks. But um, I'd probably trailer breakdowns, probably um, videos covering the specific issues that come up each each week. All, there's always something people are asking questions about. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, it will be quite busy um, trying to cover two shows at the same time. So... Um, I'll just do my best and and uh, try and marathon pace with these things. Um, I don't want to burn out. I will I will work out what I can commit to, and then I'll let you know. But always there will be breakdowns for every episode, and definitely live streams and some other stuff. Um, reflective rambling, picking up for Mike Henna uh, or Hannah. Sorry, what's Eamon's motivation? Loyalty to his brother. He got revenge at Shipbreaker Bay. Or a desire for history to view him positively. Um, Aemond is an interesting character. Uh, so he, yes, he wants revenge for himself. He's lost an eye. He wants to get revenge. Um, he does get that. What then? Then he's committed. He's on one side. Um, and he, I think he realizes that he just, his side has to win. And he is there. He is supportive of his brother. Um, they were close, and so he is definitely wanting him to be um, 
to be king. So it's loyalty. It's uh, the, initially a bit of personal vengeance. Um, and it's just a drive to be on the winning side. I think it's as simple as that. I don't think he never gives the impression of d doing it for himself, even when he is the de facto leader. Because uh, Aegon, for a large part of the and it doesn't come across, I mean, that he comes across well in the books, obviously, but it's not dwelt on in the books. Uh, but I think it will become very apparent when we see it on the show. But Aegon is very damaged um, by uh, what happens to him. And um, he uh, he's physically damaged and mentally damaged. And he gets given milk of the poppy. And for most of the war, he's actually out of it. <laughs> he's off his head. He doesn't want to engage and Aemond, as the next in line, he does most of the running. He does most of the pushing. He is put actually the main main man. And I think that we will see that on the show very clearly, is that whereas, yes, Aegon is the name, uh, the, the, the king that they're all trying to support, actually, this is, this is Aemond's war and it's Criston's war rather than um, Aegon's war. Uh, Chaos Ballerina saying part one, and there's part two later as well. Thank you. Saying what magic discipline is Alice Rivers supposed to use? Eustace calls her a woods witch. So is it the old gods? Is she a combo user like Mel, seeing visions in flames? She's supernaturally young, and she curses a man so that if he's laughed at by someone, he'll die. Um, he does, and she's far away. Is this shadow binding? Does she serve a law? Well, there are lots of questions, and we don't have answers in Fire and Blood. Um, we Fire and Blood Part Two, or Blood and Fire, as George R. R. Martin is now referring to it. Um, I'll, I'll wheel back around to Alice Rivers in a moment, but because I'm talking about that, I I now suspect we're going to see that a lot earlier than we thought we were. I I had thought that we weren't going to see that for years and years, if ever. Now I have a feeling that Fire and Blood Part Two, Blood and Fire, it may well be the next significant thing we see after the Winds of Winter. So whenever the Winds of Winter is finished, I think he will very quickly finish Fire and Blood Part 2 because he seems to enjoy writing it. He he rattled his way through Fire and Blood Part 1 when many uh, many people think that he they would have preferred him to be writing The Winds of Winter because he basically seemed to have got on a roll and loved writing it. The same seems to be true for Fire and Blood Part 2. He's written 200 pages of this already, he's admitted. Um, and when you think this is if this is going to be about the same size as Fire and Blood Part 1, that's I mean, he's a quarter of the way in already. And this is while he's actually concentrating on other stuff. So I think we're going to see that quite soon. Uh, the reason why I went down that slight digression was that uh, we will learn more about Alice Rivers in Fire and Blood Part 2, uh, for sure. Now, what we see of her, yes, we, we hear that she looks into the flames. Um, she has this... Um, uh, apparent ability to some this guy dies when somebody laughs at him um and she seems to put people under her charm spell there's lots of stuff there we have to interpret all of this through the lens of gildane is a maester who hates magic and doesn't like magic and therefore is trying to paint her in as bad a light as possible so we shouldn't necessarily Pardon me. We shouldn't necessarily take everything he says as being literal truth. Added to which she, and the reason why I'm saying Fire and Blood Part 2 will learn, she claims that she's got heir to the throne, a Targaryen, uh, as a child. So she will be important. What, on the basis of what we know at the moment, what is she? I, I mean, I don't tend to personally put George R. Martin's magic into these silos. I think that the people 
in world often think of them as being their as being silos but i think a lot of the more powerful magicians actually merge a few of these and use magic per se from a number of different um stances and perspectives what i mean by that is uh, we have so melisandre has magic shadow binding magic from a shy as well as uh, the magic that she seems to have learned about reading uh the for seeing visions in fire which comes from uh relore. that's where the religion has taught her that blood raven clearly he he uses a lot of the sort of uh old magic um children of the forest magic but also he's got targaryen magic flowing through him as well euron seems to be blending and merging a lot of uh, magic he's using the magic of the um undying but also he seems to have some sort of green seer magic to him so a lot of the more powerful magic users do seem to merge a lot of the to use bits of different types of magic so my instinct is that that's what's going on with alice rivers is that she um she is using a lot of different types of magic the seeing things in the flames does have a kind of a hint of relore to it but we're not there's nothing else that suggests relore um the Harren hall itself has got a lot of uh sort of green seary magic whether it wants it or not because it's right next to the isle of faces because there's a huge godswood there um with a massive uh, weirwood tree so there's a lot of that uh, my instinct is that she is a magic user possibly a self-taught magic user um you could call them a woods witch uh but i think that she just uses lots of different types and doesn't um come at it from a very um dogmatic perspective of saying i'm only doing this because this is the type of magic that i use i hope that made made sense um one day i will do my grand overarching theory of of magic in a song of ice and fire i'll do a video on that um uh but this is not that day um i i sh I, I definitely shall do it at some point um last question from my patrons before i dive into the chat um Zachalok, what would be the best ending scene for you uh for this show um great question uh i do it's something i've, th I've thought about for me you could end it at a number of different places but there is one great ending scene that we have in the book that works for me because the this doesn't the dance doesn't truly end until Aegon the second is dead and we know that Aegon the third is going to be king that's the point it, it ends it doesn't truly end until um we get the hour of the wolf has gone now the the story in fire and blood ends with uh, a very craig and stark just saying a very blunt thing a very northern thing and then leaving he he he's done he's done his business there he's finished everything off um he's killed the people he thinks needs to be killed he's uh, effectively um crowned the new king um and and he takes his chain of office hand of the king throws it down uh the new king uh quits his job and then he growls uh, the snows are falling in the north and my place is at winterfell <laughs> and then he goes and that's it he's there short period of time bosses it ends the war uh establishes everything uh and then just says my place is not here my place is in the north and then just marches out and it's he's such a but i i um, i would i already i can imagine him in my mind and uh actually chat this is a thing 
I would love to know your dream cast of who who Craig and Stark should be, because this is somebody who should come in in the last few episodes of the whole show and absolutely boss it, absolutely be the most uh, powerful person and then just turn around and say, my place isn't here and go away. You need a character with some, uh, an actor with some huge gravitas to be able to do that. Um, so 